Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the break. I'm Sandy Moll, Executive Director of InfraGuard National, and it's my pleasure to introduce your next session on a topic that's certainly a focal point of our organization. InfraGuard National represents the private sector component of the FBI's InfraGuard program, which is the Bureau's largest public-private partnership and dedicated to protecting U.S. critical infrastructure and the American people. Since its inception in 1996, InfraGuard has grown to nearly 35,000 members and 74 local InfraGuard chapters nationwide, each attached to one of the FBI's 56 field offices. In each field office, a special agent is designated as a private sector coordinator, specifically to work the InfraGuard program and conduct private sector engagement and outreach. At the national level, the InfraGuard program falls under the Office of Private Sector, which is the FBI's primary liaison with the American business community. Um, since its inception 27 years ago, I mean, at the time, uh, the InfraGuard, the idea and concept of, of InfraGuard was quite ahead of its time. Uh, but in the years since, it's been proven that only by working together can the government and private industry uh, work to strengthen national security and homeland security. Um, InfraGuard fosters collaboration, networking, and information sharing on security threats and risks to protect um, American innovation, our economic interests, our public health and safety, our technology, and many other aspects that constitute the foundation of American life. Events like the Homeland Security Enterprise Forum are a vital part of the information sharing apparatus that helps keep our nation safe. And it's my privilege to introduce our next session on supply chain and critical infrastructure resilience investments. Significant geopolitical, technological, and economic risks present vulnerabilities to our supply chains and critical infrastructure. How should the Homeland Security Enterprise address these? And what is the vision for how economic security and homeland security are related? Your esteemed moderator today is Suzanne Spaulding, HSEG member and senior advisor for Homeland Security at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She previously served as undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate of DHS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, uh, welcome uh, to this conversation about supply chain risk management and critical infrastructure. Uh, and, and how uh, we can incentivize uh, industry and government to move in the direction that we need to move to enhance our nation's security. We had a great conversation yesterday in our breakout session on this same topic. We had a wonderful group around the table, and I know, uh, Rob, I think we're, we'll be writing that up and getting out some uh, recommendations that arose from that group. Um, but that also helped to inform the conversation that we'll have today. So I want to thank everybody off the bat who came to that and contributed to that conversation. That was really terrific. <clears throat> I thought we would start today uh, with a, uh, you know, talking about why, we, why it is so important that we have this conversation. Why, what, is about, what is it about the world in which we're living in today that has elevated this issue of supply chain risk management, uh, and that makes it so important. And uh, to, to kick us off, I, and as I come to each of you, I will ask you to introduce yourselves, because we've got a great panel here. And as you could tell from the way they sorted themselves out in these chairs, they're really in charge. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. But Moshe, why don't you start, uh, introduce yourself, and then Give us a sense of the context in which we're having this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Suzanne. So I'm Moshe Nelson. I'm a partner at Guidehouse in our defense and security practice. Uh, for the past uh, two decades, I have been supporting the De Department of Homeland Security Apparatus, Defense, and Department of State related to supply chain matters, supply chain risk management matters. Uh, I've also spent considerable time in the Middle East, uh, boots on the ground, dealing with uh, Israeli-Palestinian issues. So this is a very timely discussion. Um, to to you know, get to your question, why does it matter today? Um, well, let me uh, for a second pull back to the conversation we had earlier uh, this morning, uh, just a fantastic conversation about China, decoupling, uh, decoupling policies with China, and their impacts on supply chain management. COVID-19 was a wake-up call in the supply chain community, I mean, in, in the global community, clearly. Um, we had spent approximately two decades before that 
globalizing without uh, any parameters for uh, development, su trade, supply chain management that really looked at downstream resilient effects. And uh, what we saw was when um, matters became very challenging as a result of the pandemic, um, you know, there, were, there was essentially need to create um, you know, a decoupling effort uh, with, within uh, trade within, with China. And that has essentially been um, you know, a focal point for uh, the past couple of years. Uh, significant efforts have uh, resulted. We, we talked about nearshoring and friendshoring, where there's regionalization, a re-globalization of supply chain and trade. Uh, and the private sector has effectively been reacting to that. Um, having to tra change uh, buying patterns, um, ensuring that we can find components um, you know, internally during crises, but as well as determine you know, where supply chain um, sources, information, and analytics uh, will come from. So the discussion that we had on this morning around China is, you know, I think, one of the lar large factors. Uh, the second one is you know, related to uh, destabilization and conflicts and war. So with the uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, there was obviously a, a a significant impact on high tech uh, into the United States, as well as you know critical food supplies uh, for for uh, you know global partners. Um, that has effectively changed the posture and how we think about uh, managing our own supply chain as it relates to you know the the homeland security apparatus. Uh, just recently, and we have discussed you know the tragic events um, over the weekend. Uh, you know, with the terrorist attacks in Israel. And if you take a step back, this wasn't, this isn't just a singular event, this is ongoing and progressing. Uh, and the information that is being uh, pushed out by the Wall Street Journal, uh, even on Sunday, indicating the Iranian planning with uh, Hezbollah and Hamas um, related to, to this attack, um, and the timing of that to coincide with U.S., Saudi, and Israeli peace initiatives that would change the dynamic of, uh, of well, increase and change the dynamic of power within the Middle East, there, there was, there's no uh, coincidence. Um, that's, that's just a realization. And when we pull that back to supply chain risk management and understand if that was the genesis of this heinous attack and the uh, increase of velocity of um, the, the, the fighting um, and atrocities in the Middle East, then we can need to expect the downstream impacts on our supply chain, which will principally be in that region, the effects on uh, obviously crude oil. Now, the, the peace agreement that the US, um, Israel, and Saudi Arabia were uh, undergoing would have created you know, more military security for the Suez Canal, uh, for um, the Strait of Hormuz, and uh, the Gulf of Oman. And that effectively shores up uh, supply chain efforts. So pulling it back to supply chain risk management in our, in our infrastructure environment, as events like this unfold, how are we planning effectively for what uh, ostensibly will be impacts on our energy sector um, in the short and, and long term in a uh, holistic supply chain risk management matter, because it matters today, and everyone in this room has a part of uh, addressing it. Yeah, great. Uh, very comprehensive, Moshe, thank you, and very scary. Uh, and that energy supply chain is actually uh, one of the better understood supply chains um, as opposed to so many of our supply chains where we really lack real visibility. We have very poor visibility into our supply chains. Um, Bob, what else uh, have you seen, perhaps not quite as recently, but over the last couple of years that has elevated uh, this issue of supply chain and, and made it so important? And then, you know, you're probably the most recent to have been in government and you're certainly looking at it from the outside give us a sense of how well situated we are, particularly from the government's 
on the government side sure. uh, to be addressing these issues and the issues that are going to be quite urgent. Sure. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Um, for those of you I don't know, I'm Bob Kalaski. I'm Senior Vice President for Critical Infrastructure at Exeger, which is a supply chain risk management company. So as I said yesterday, I think I'm at the right panel at least, uh, talking about critical infrastructure and supply chain. Um, we, we are trying at Exeger to build the best models and sources of data and analysis to understand how supply chains work and sources of supply chain risk, to illuminate supply chains and sources of risk within that. Um, and deploy that to support government and, and commercial clients. We, we support uh, parts of DHS, a lot of the Defense Department and, and the like, but also commercial clients to, to get the kind of supply chain transparency you need to address the issues, um, the, the macro geopolitical issues that Moshe was talking about. Um, and so, so as a pivot to your question of why is this a homeland security conversation, in, in my, my experience, you know, I think Suzanne, we're, we're gonna talk about critical infrastructure security and resiliency policy in PPD 21 in a little bit. But 10 years ago when we were um, helping, when, when the President Obama released PPD 21 and we were helping write the National Infrastructure Is Protection. Is that really 10 years ago, yeah. He signed the executive order, or he signed the PPD 21 on a date, Suzanne, that's very important to you and I, February 12th, 2013. Suzanne and I share a birthday, which is February 12th. So, mm -hmm. um, so, so it was the date of PPD 21, so, so we remember it well. Um, but we wrote the National Infrastructure Protection Plan and didn't talk a lot about critical China and Russia as a risk in 2013 to the national critical infrastructure. We didn't talk a lot about supply chain as a risk vector. It, you know, it, it was something that contributed to the risks, but, but it wasn't a particular risk vector. And if you look, you know, one of the reasons you have to update PPD 21 right now is because the macro risk condition to homeland security in, in our critical infrastructure is now driven substantially by, by nation states and by nation state econo economic activity. And supply chain enters as not just an enabler for critical infrastructure, but also as a, a risk vector and a source of critical infrastructure to, to some extent. And that's- Source of critical infrastructure risk. But also a source, you know, some, oh, there, are yes. no, there are nodes within a supply chain right. that can be critical, right? And, and so we now enter a stage where supply chain has to be higher on your risk register. I think that's what we're talking about. When I was in government, we, we talked about it in, in, in conversations and still now, right, in terms of cyber vulnerabilities introduced by information communications technology, operational technologies, and things where our adversaries would, would look for back doors or would look for bad code or would just take advantage of counterfeit and things like that. So, so the digital supply chain risk is one of the leading sources of cyber targets. Um, Dan, Dan's gonna talk a little bit more about sort of operational supply chain risks and in the middle of a disaster, going back to, we, a lot of us lived through Katrina, going back to things like Hurricane Katrina, where supply sources were no longer available and if, if you didn't put the supply chain back together, critical, critical services, critical assets, critical technologies couldn't get to where they needed to be and communities were, were at risk. So you had to think about supply chain restoration as an, and, and the operational issues as a homeland security issue. And then there's the, the geopolitical type events that Moshe was talking about and, and particularly um, you know, what, what I lived through certainly helping understand supply chain risks in the context of the pandemic and, and what critical functions might be challenged by that. So, so I, I, in DHS, I, I thought about supply chain from a operations, a cyber, and a, and a sort of contingency, geopolitical or, or man-made or natural disaster contingency things. Then you layer on other things that can happen to impact su supply chain, port closures because of um, labor, labor strife, right? Port, port closures just because of overwhelming of the way that shipping patterns st start to work. Um, you know, regulatory changes, the, the baby formula um, experience that, that, you know, a lot of new families lived through about a year, year and a half ago of, you know, there was a regulatory shift, there was a risk in a baby formula plant, something that became really important, that, you, know, you know, something be, that became important was suddenly unavailable. And those things, you know, aren't homeland security issues, but they become homeland security issues. And so grappling with what it means to stay in advance of anticipating what could happen, what supplies are important, what supply chains are important, and what can happen to disrupt them, and proactively thinking about ways to de-risk some of those supply challenges is all part of what I, what I would say belongs in, in our national homeland security strategy. And then that's gonna lead to a conversation about how do we deal with that from a, from a governance pros 
from a risk assessment process, from a sharing of information process, from a getting industry and, and government to the table to address those issues and mitigate those risks, which I'm looking forward to talking about. So. Great, great. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that in greater detail. And Dan, um, feel free to add uh, you know to the to the context and and where the government uh, is is currently in addressing this, but particularly from your expertise at DHS uh, around emergency management, your role at FEMA, and thinking about this as a risk management issue in your current role uh, at Marshall Condon. So uh, tell folks you know, who you are and, and your background and then. Great, well thank you Suzanne, and it feels like old home week here. Okay. I, I'd pinch myself, remind myself that I'm no longer at FEMA because Bob and I had these same conversations, it seems like just yesterday, but really it was during Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Maria, I mean, our whole careers, I think, have just, uh, we've been focusing on these issues. Anyways, Dan Kanuski, Marsh McLennan, Managing Director of Public Sector. Uh, Marsh McLennan is the largest commercial property and casualty insurance brokerage in the world, so we help big companies get insurance. My particular focus is public sector, so I help governments, uh, specifically here in the US, uh, local, state, and federal governments get the risk management services and insurance they need. As was mentioned, my previous role in the past administration was as deputy administrator at FEMA. I specifically oversaw resilience. And I think that's really the, the, the key issue here from my perspective is, is resilience. We had a great discussion yesterday in the breakout session that Suzanne led talking about how resilience applies to supply chain. And obviously it does. I mean, every, every one of these disasters we've seen, certainly the catastrophic ones we've seen, it tests the resilience of our supply chain. It tests the ability of our supply chains to provide the private sector as well as the government with the resources it needs, especially during times of stress, right, which includes disasters. So when I think of resilience, especially in the emergency management context, it was something you know, I'm very proud I put in place at FEMA, which is FEMA's focus on resilience, which uh, today I think, you know, you see this administration, they've doubled down on that idea. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that, if, frankly, all of, uh, for all of FEMA's history, it was thought of as the disaster response agency. It was thought of as the agency to government, to state and local governments, the one that reimburses them for their disaster losses. And to be a little more blunt, it was known as the federal government's ETM, ATM. And so the federal government's ATM is now transformed into what is truly, I believe, a resilience agency. It does so by focusing on an all hazards approach to emergency management. So it really doesn't matter what causes the disruption to the supply chain or the disruption to an individual disaster survivor or to a government. All that matters is that we need to bounce back. We need to uh, withstand, obviously, that stress and bounce back really as quickly as we can. And so focusing on areas like preparedness and mitigation and insurance will ensure that there is resilience when a disaster occurs. The same thing can be thought of in the private sector. And Suzanne, to your point about being a risk manager in the private sector, those are still key issues. We may call them different things, right? We have different terms, we may focus on them differently, but the implications are the same. If you're not prepared, if you haven't mitigated your risks, if you don't have insurance, then your organization is gonna be more vulnerable. So if you look at Hurricane, uh, you mentioned Katrina, let's talk about Hurricane Maria. That's about when I started at FEMA. FEMA had endured not just one catastrophic disaster, but three back-to-back -back disasters in 2017, Harvey, Irma, and Maria. So by the time I got there, not only was FEMA maxed out, the workforce maxed out, but quite frankly, the supply chains were maxed out. And I'll never forget that we tried to source anything we could, whether it be food and water and generators. And the head of logistics at FEMA came in and saw us in the administrator's office and said, you're never gonna believe this, but we're out. I said, out of what? And he goes down this long list, right? How do we run out of these supplies? We had, we had planned for the worst case scenario and we had exceeded it? How's that possible? Well, it's because this, the stockpiles had been depleted from Harvey and Irma, and by the time we had another catastrophic disaster like Maria, we just didn't have it on hand. And I said, oh, this is no problem. We have contracts for this. We have contingency contracts. We go to the private sector and they provide, they source that. And the head of logistics said, already did that. They're out. That was incredible to think that we maxed out some of these critical supplies, that there really was nothing left in the hopper. 
Well, the ways we worked around it, we ended up finding other, other contract vehicles. We raised, and this is very inside the Beltway, we raised the contract ceiling on a number of contracts to the point where we never, ever had anticipated needing to do so. In other words, we need to put more money through those contracts than we had ever planned out in a worst case scenario. So I thought that was the worst case scenario, right? So we went for the worst case scenario before Maria, then Maria was the new worst case scenario. Well, then what happened? 2020 rolls around, this thing called a pandemic, which stresses these beyond anything we ever could have imagined. Instead of having a disaster in, you know, successive disasters in three states, three areas, we had it in 50 states simultaneously. So there was a new worst case scenario. So anyway, my point is you can only prepare so much and you can only think so, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like what's in the art of the you know, imaginable. It's really probably worse than you think and you get a plan for that truly worst case scenario. Yeah, <clears throat> so Moshe, um, I'm gonna ask you to uh, give some thoughts on how you institutionalize the kind of agility that, that is necessary for uh, dealing with the unanticipated, right? The sure. unforeseen, but, um, but before we do, I, wanna, I just wanna um, foot stomp, uh, and thank you, Dan, for really emphasizing that notion of resilience, right? As a, as a critical piece of risk management. I was so pleased to hear Heather Atkins from Google yesterday up on the stage talk about the fact that in, in the context of cyber, that we don't, we still don't put enough attention and planning and resources and effort on resilience. We use the word a lot more now. It appears in a lot more of the strategy documents. And it was certainly one of the pillars on the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, on which I had the honor to serve. Um, but, the, uh, but, but in terms of really devoting resources to it, it is still in that classic risk management formula where you assess risk as a factor of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. We still are putting overwhelmingly our attention on threat and vulnerability and not nearly enough on understanding the consequences. Uh, and resilience is all about understanding those consequences and then bringing your enterprise together to brainstorm on ways to mitigate those consequences. Not that you do that in lieu of prevention, but that you, it's got to be part of your continuity of operations planning, part of your mission essential functions planning. Um, so I, so I, I wanna hear about how you uh, can assess. So that assessment piece, right, which is understanding those consequences requires greater visibility into your supply chain. How do you achieve that? Um, how do you change your risk calculus depending on the context, right? We talked sure. a bit about that yesterday. Um, the, the baby formula that is not on Homeland Security's radar screen and probably shouldn't be in a normal circumstance um, suddenly becomes and your risk You've got to now assess risk assessments that put certain policies in place. You've got to reassess the risks, right? The risk calculus needs to change. And how do we inform that? How do we make sure we've got the things in place that we need to have the agility to both plan for the things we can foresee and address things that we can't? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I started off with saying that supply chain risk management, supply chain management is a systems approach. Um, you know, I, I thought, Dan, it was, it was just su such a great example of when you were discussing with FEMA that, well, the answer was to just go out to the private sector or increase the, the ceiling on the contract, but not realizing that the, the ecosystem that was available for that given product uh, was limited, right? And no matter how high you raise the ceiling, you're still not going to get what you need. So from a supply chain risk management perspective, the first step is understanding your environment, understanding your ecosystem. Where are the players? Where are the sources of the supply chain? What are the risks that are going to affect that? Financial, political, um, uh, economic, um, you know, weather. Social. Social, right? Uh, the, imp the, the impact on social media, right? On, on any uh, given topic area. So understanding the ecosystem, essentially laying out, um, you know, where the, where the supplier base is, how that is, what are the drivers of that supplier base? Um, what are some macro level changes that would occur that may have impacts on that supplier, supplier base uh, 
that will impact um, ultimately your ability to source that information. Um, you know, the, the great thing about supply chain risk management is that it's very defined. That's why I love it. I play with it, right? It's a lot of ones and zeros. So it, as soon as you map out the supply chain and understand uh, the players doing you know, due diligence to predict what the need is. And we talked a lot about yesterday in our, uh, in our discussions, scenario planning, particularly with the critical infrastructure working with government, and this is the ideal state, to run scenarios in which you know, we can predict what is the worst case scenario? What's the, the conflict we're not thinking about? What's a major piece of legislation that's gonna be put in place that will then affect Apple setting up um, manufacturing centers in Mexico for iPhones, which will then have a downstream impact on the Port of Mariposa um, and NII. And what will that impact have for security as people are trying to smuggle uh, goods through those, those services, ergo back to our critical infrastructure. Um, there's great analytical capabilities that obviously we put on top of that um, with, with uh, including human in the loop. So you know, running the analysis, running these scenarios from a quantitative perspective, use, utilizing you know, uh, very effective softwares in the marketplace, um, and then essentially stacking those risks and mitigation strategies so that you can um, effectively you know, take action. Now, a, a great point that we discussed yesterday was the, the need to have a learning organization to do those retrospectives. What, what went wrong when, in the COVID-19 pandemic? And do the retrospectives in a way that allow us to, to take it from a point of continuous improvement so we can mitigate the risk in the future rather than a punitive effort to point fingers um, you know, at, at what went wrong. Uh, and then from, from there, essentially creating a governance council where you can work the, with the appropriate individuals to affect the right change in government that may be policy on the private sector, working groups, industry associations to harden the resilient supply chain that is necessary for our critical infrastructure environment. That yep, good, that answer? great. Yes, okay. you did. Yes, you did. And previewed some of our recommendations. Oh, boy. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, that's good. Perfect. Um, so, Bob, we have uh, talked about both, you mentioned, both cyber supply chain risk, information risk, sort of the, the, the uh, you know, maybe solar winds, uh, other, uh, you know, kind of um, what's led to the SBOM, the yeah. Software Bill of Materials. I know there's some debate about the value of that. Um, but we've been mostly talking, most of the examples and conversations we've been having is really more about sort of that uh, physical supply chain, uh, availability of supplies, reliability in terms of availability as opposed to reliability in terms of integrity or security. Um, PPD21 definitely took an all hazards approach to the resilience, security and resilience of critical infrastructure across cyber and physical. When Congress created CISA, despite the fact that people think it's just a cyber uh, security agency, they chose to continue to give it that all hazards mission. It is cybersecurity and infrastructure security, and I wish it had the word resilience in it, um, agency. Um, do you think that's still the right approach? To, and should we think about this clearly uh, the, uh, as you delve into uh, actually addressing supply chain as opposed to uh, trying to assess and understand the things you might want to do, as you really delve into it, you have to get very specific, right, um, and very detailed, and each sector is going to be different, uh, and each entity is going to be a little bit different. But is there some, I mean, as you look at to the rewrite of PPD21, are you looking for an all hazards approach? Certainly, and, and I, I forgot in introducing myself, I, I worked with Suzanne when she was at MPPD and I was at the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency and, and ran the National Risk Management Center and served as the Acting Assistant Secretary of Infrastructure Protection, so, so I've got some perspective from that time. Um, to, to your question, let, let's start with the corporate level. You, first of all, let, let's say some exceedingly obvious things. A supply chain is the decision by a, a business at the corporate level, to buy something from somebody under a certain contracted condition up to a certain level of things and expect for it to show up and how it flows from where it was bought from, from, from there. And, and so that's what you're doing. You're creating your own supply chains by making buying decisions and you're buying things that, you know, if you buy a 
laptop from somebody, you're, buy, you're, you're buying also Dell's supply chain as well because Dell's laptop depends on, on other things. And at a corporate level to your all hazards question, you want, and, and, and certainly we see, you, you want the supply chain office and the acquisitions professional and the chief risk officer to sit and say, is that thing going to show up at scale at the price that, that I, I bought it for, right? And, and that's and be, and be the thing I bought. In other words, yes. uh, getting be, be to the, the thi integrity. Be, be the thing I bought. Do I have confidence that it will be available? Do I have a contingency plan if something happens where the factory or the shipping channel I bought it from? And have I planned for all of those things? But am I introducing new vulnerabilities to my IT systems through the supply chain? Am I introducing new vulnerabilities to my high value assets? You know, that's something that, so the chief information security officer needs to be part of that conversation. Um, am I buying something that can be sourced to forced labor from the Xinjiang region of China and, and now is on the wrong side of the UF LPA? The chief compliance officer needs to be part of that conversation. The probably somebody who's handling corporate communications in case there's something. And, and so, you know, businesses have no choice, and, and we certainly preach this for, from a corporate perspective, to have all those players in the room to think about these risks holistically and not just optimize for operational delivery if you're gonna find yourself out of compliance or you're gonna buy something that's less secure that's gonna threaten your intellectual property or threaten your operations through, through a cyber vulnerability. And the government has done a very, very good job, the Homeland Security Enterprise has done a very good job of saying, we need these decision makers all to be thinking of these things from an all hazards risk perspective. And we need sort of integrated decision making. Ideally, it happens at the enterprise level. It's part of enterprise risk governance that the board and the CEO and the C-suite are, are thinking about these sorts of things. So, so th that seems to me to be fairly obvious. And you know, it's difficult to balance risks against things, right? It's difficult to balance cost performance, schedule, and security, but, but it has to be done. I would argue that, that as we think about that from the government, the last thing you would want to step away is a government that isolates risk by, by risk. And, and you do need a government that has the players who are thinking about the analog from a critical infrastructure security and resilience perspective of are all those risks being balanced? Are we properly thinking, so, so throw in the homeland security context, but then are we thinking about sort of economic stimulus and environmental considerations and safety considerations and other things that are part of a government this, um, process in, in which you're, you're trying to assess things that are critical? Are we, are we you know, French or are, are we doing those sorts of things? And that should all be holistically toward what we want to build is a more resilient supply chain that corporations can take advantage of and incentives for, for them to do that. And so, so that becomes a messy governance challenge of making sure that, that balancing different risks, incentives, and diff different opportunities incentives are part of the conversation. I don't know that the government right now is very well organized to have that messy conversation about balancing economic security, national security, and, and, and trade policy, and, and environmental standards, and, and infrastructure investment, and things like that. And I think that's really gonna be a challenge for Homeland Security. How does Homeland Security get a seat at the table to be part of those conversations, to think long term about strengthening the resilience of supply chains by using levers that are available to different parts of government. Yeah, it's always it's always a challenge when you've got issues that cut across so many parts of government. Um, we yeah, so we're, we're we're all familiar with that challenge. And one of the things we spent a, a fair amount of time talking about yesterday is. Um, from the standpoint, if we're, if we're going to look at supply chain risk management from the standpoint of the Homeland Security Enterprise, is that a different piece, is that a subset of a broader discussion that encompasses economic, uh, uh, economic impact, um, et cetera, beyond those things that might rise to the level of a, of a Homeland Security threat, for example, or a Homeland Security concern? Um, and Dan, you you know again, you you come at this from a uh, your your role in disaster response gives you a slightly different perspective than the one we had at CISA, with a real focus on security aspect. So you might have some insights into how we ought to think about that, um, and whether DHS is the right place to center a broader that broader piece of bringing the entire government together to think about supply chain risk management holistically, is that a Department of Commerce piece to which DHS feeds into? What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, first I'd like to associate myself with the comments that Moshe made about the ecosystem. And what Bob said is taking a holistic approach. Completely agree, and I see that in spades in the emergency management community, where all too often, as I mentioned, FEMA is thought of as a federal first responder. FEMA is thought of as the response agency. That also is the same way that state emergency managers are viewed and local emergency managers are viewed. So you have tens of thousands of emergency managers who have been trained and viewed by the American public as responders. And we're really trying to change that whole culture, change that whole dynamic to make those emergency managers more proactive. And this is something I, I spoke about at the National Emergency Management Association last week. And the reason I mention it is because it was really for the first time in memory that I, I had brought in a, a panel of insurance experts. And you think, oh, of course, emergency management insurance, there's some sy the synergies there are strong. We're seeing, obviously, what's happening with um, insurers leaving some states where they're at particularly high risk. But believe it or not, in the steady state, even though we say all the right things in emergency management, we're all hazards, we plan, we prepare, we insure, we mitigate, those conversations weren't happening between the insurance industry and emergency managers. So what does it take? It takes, a, you know, it takes this major event, uh, which is insurers leaving these high-risk states, with emergency managers suddenly being thrust into the responsibility of managing this risk as a public risk instead of a risk that was otherwise managed by the private sector. And so, obviously, the same, there's an analog here with whether it be the example I used from Maria or from the pandemic, where the government, again, was thrust into this responsibility as the risk manager, the ones to fix these broken supply chains, the one to deliver goods needed, you know, that we rely on every day to the American public. And that's an uncomfortable position for the government to be in. The government's often not best positioned to deliver those services. The story I told yesterday was here we were at FEMA struggling to get generators and food and water down to Puerto Rico when we realized that the reason that they didn't have, you know, the disaster survivors in Puerto Rico didn't have those, those needs was because the power grid was down, because grocery stores couldn't open, because their power that they rely on for their daily lives was not available. And we said, we're doing this wrong. Rather than sending goods down, as, you know, as much as that's needed in the immediate aftermath, our goal should be to restore these supply chains, to restore critical infrastructure. And I'll never forget calling Bob and saying, Bob, we need your help. We need CISA as, a, as an equal partner in this disaster response. And to answer Suzanne's question, like what, what should be done? Well, I can say that the reason that FEMA is able to do what it does is because it has the authority to do so. It has the Stafford Act. And it also has the resources, the Disaster Relief Fund, assuming that Congress replenishes that account when they're supposed to. Um, right now, it's <laughs> depleted. Uh, anyways, uh, the Stafford Act is the authority. The Disaster Relief Fund is the funding. What are the equivalent authorities and funding that CISA has? And the short answer is it's, there's not. And that hobbles CISA from its, you know, its primary mission of supporting critical infrastructure. But it very much uh, prevents it from taking on an additional responsibility on supply chain, as we just talked about. So my short answer is I don't know the best place to put it. I would say I'm biased towards CISA because they've always been such great partners when I was at FEMA. But no matter where it goes, it needs to have the authority, real statutory authority that will not go away with you know, changing winds. And it needs to have the funding available to do its mission. So, so can I? Just, yeah, please. And, so no. so I, I'd like to just foot stomp but say very clearly, I think the paradigm you're talking about is the private sector is going to put supply chains back together as much as possible, and the private sector should be calling government and saying, I can't put the supply chain back together because something, a border's closed, or something can't ship, or I, I can't, something's not available here, or there's a rule that says I can't source my baby formula from Europe right now, and, and there. The government needs to take the private sector has to have the ability to talk to the government about, this is why I can't put my supply chain back together. And can you government enable and help fix that? And then going back to the question of authorities and whose responsibility it is, in the middle of a disaster, there needs to be a clear input level where industry can say, these critical supplies are going to break or are breaking. 
I, I need help. There, there needs to be, that needs to be clearly defined. And then in advance of disaster, work through the scenarios Moshe's talking about, and oh, this supply chain's li likely to break in the face of this thing, and can you help build resilience into the supply chain? And that's where you get into money and authorities. I, I think you did sort of hand wave that the Stafford Act and the DERF are good tools, but they're not the necessarily the full tool, fulsome tool you need for a supply chain fix. And so, to your question, where, 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 how is the government organized to do that, and are, do they have the right authorities to evaluate that, and who's doing the hard work of evaluating the existing authorities and saying we need additional authorities to make the supply chain more resilient? I think the HSEC, the Homeland Security Advisory Committee, recommended that DHS take that on through a supply chain resilience center, but frankly, we haven't heard if DHS is going to take that on fulsomely and what, what does DHS need to do that effectively. And I know that there's planning going on within the department. Commerce has some plans. But, but I would really love to see from sitting on the industry side, government to be a little more clear about what additional authorities, what additional processes, and, and where, what are they going to build to help industry put supply chains back together? Yeah, yeah. And it is going to require, to use that trite phrase, a whole of government effort here, even if the uh, you know, locus of risk assessment sits, may, maybe sits with, as it does now, with the National Risk Management Center. I do think this should all be driven, our priorities should be driven by national critical functions, and it is NRMC that, that is doing the analytical work to develop those national critical functions. How are they disrupted by supply chain? That's where our, our first priority should be, and that's the work of CISA. Private sector has a has the most important role to play here, and all the knowledge, uh, really, to bring to the table. Um, and so, CISA has those relationships and working with the SRMAs, the the, uh, the sector risk management agency. So that does seem like you know perhaps the right like right place to start. But the part of the topic of this panel was investment. CISA doesn't have any tools with regard really to investment. Um, and there is where I think you really need to bring the entities of government together with the private sector to say, where can there be targeted investment to incentivize um, more resilient supply chains? The DFC, for example, the International Development Finance Corporation, has a key role to play potentially in sourcing of materials for uh, around the world for electric uh, vehicle batteries, for example. Can their investment play a role there? That's just one example of the kinds of targeted investments. So um, Moshe, you're welcome to jump in, but we have about seven and a half minutes left. Uh, and, I'm, uh, and I thought I might open it up to the, to the audience Sounds like a great uh, idea. for questions. Um, and hopefully somebody's been provoked. You want to disagree? You want to say you haven't even talked about X? I thought you were going to talk about this. These guys have a lot more to say. We've got one here. Yeah, I had a question uh, in terms of it's kind of, uh, uh, my name is Boris. Uh, I had a qu question about, uh, for example, technologies like, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, hydrogen based of technologies, right? Because we talked about electric vehicles and batteries replenishing and all those things, but uh, it seems like, you know, the whole EV things, it's kind of, I hate to say it, but old news, you know? But in terms of like a hydrogen-based technologies, for example, there are certain auto manufacturing uh, already have like a prototypes, and I know from infrastructure perspective, it, we're not there yet, I get it. But from in terms of truly disruptive technologies which, which can make us energy independent and get the cost down of technologies, you know, and make it affordable for pretty much anyone, uh, you know, for example, hydrogen-based technology is probably it. What are your thoughts on it? So is there, uh, you're actually asking, could we get out ahead of something that isn't a crisis for us yet? I don't know that there's any precedent for that. Moshe, you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I will say, um, I, I think, and it goes back to, the, to what I started with. The first thing needs to do is the understanding your problem set, your e ecosystem, and your planning. So if, if hydrogen are, is one of the alternatives in your scenario on how to you know, essentially effectively um, you know, keep energy, uh, excuse me, power going within critical infrastructure, then 
uh, determining what's a supply chain to get there. And, and you, I understand in Ukraine, right, that in some of the, the ports that, uh, that exist on the seaports, there were uh, hydrogen um, uh, usage as part of that uh, essential operation. So it's, there has been precedent set. This is a wonderful topic because there are innovations that are occurring globally, and it's about targeting you know, that alternative uh, as it relates to your ecosystems of alternatives for scenario planning. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, you, you joked about getting in front of a crisis, but, but it's, it's worth talking about, right? Hydrogen, other ways of clean energy, um, electrification, other ways of energy innovation, that, that's all at the core of the, um, the, the Infrastructure Investment Act that, that passed a couple years ago. The Department of Energy is getting a lot of money to stimulate alternative sources, but to what most said, let's make sure that in doing so, there's going to be sufficient supply to take advantage of it, and there's not new risk introduced through new technologies and, and like, you know, I, I'm familiar from a cyber perspective that some of, the, some of the concerns with some of the solar companies, for example, so, so if we're gonna make things more critical through innovation and allowing and enabling and incentivizing innovation, let's, as you suggest, Suzanne, stay in front of what is the thing that's gonna be more critical and have we anticipated that risk and maybe built, built risk mitigation in at the beginning rather than wake up and, and all of a sudden, you know, we, we constantly wake up and the world's changed and we're like, oh shoot, the world's changed and there's new risk that's been introduced. We can sort of anticipate some of the ways the world's changing and, and try to stay in front of the risk. And, and I, I think this is an area where, where better analysis is needed. I, I agree. And as you heard me say, I mean, disasters have a funny way of revealing the weakest link in the supply chain, right? So being able to test that, stress that system prior to disasters, obviously going to be better. You don't want to find out in the middle of a disaster that the critical facility for hydrogen is in this location and 80, I'm making this number up, but 80% of the hydrogen available to the United States is in that facility, which is not operational. And something very similar to that did happen. Uh, it happens in almost every major catastrophic disaster, but there are certainly several examples of that in Hurricane Maria, where there were supply dis disruptions, not just for the disaster survivors, which is FEMA's primary uh, focus, but also the disruptions to the American public, which is CIS's primary focus. One of, my, one of my ideas in government that I never got done was to actually create a net assessment of the future of infrastructure. Because I think that's an answerable question. What's infrastructure gonna look like 20 years from now? And actually pay for th that kind of thinking and then stop and say, okay, if this is how we think infrastructure is gonna emerge because of technologies and availability of certain things, what risks have been introduced? And, and that kind of long-term thinking about infrastructure is that being brought into security. Yeah, and that kind of analysis can inform these investment decisions, right? So as we move into emerging technologies, we're, we're increasingly, as a country, getting comfortable with, I still put small i, small p, industrial policy, uh, and, and, and around trying to have more reliable supply chains, et cetera. Can we build more into those investment decisions, particularly by government, to, to put that burden on the private sector to say, if we're going to invest, in these emerging technologies, you must show us that you have considered supply chain, that you have engaged in supply chain risk management, that you have assessed it and you have mitigated those risks, that you understand them. Um, that ought to be a predecessor to grants, to investments, to uh, contracts. We talked about that yesterday. Um, we ought to be, as a government, providing those incentives to the private sector. We have time, I think, for one more question or closing remarks from our panelists. Marshall? Sure. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, I think that this is such a critical time to be looking at supply chain risk management. Partnerships between industry and government uh, need to increase and strengthen. And we need to have a, an understanding of, you know, what are the geopolitical challenges facing us today, and what's gonna to happen tomorrow, two weeks from now? Middle East is a great example, and we shouldn't lose track of that. Yeah, to channel my inner Dan Kanuski, planning and exercises around these scenarios and, and to build up against anticipation. And you know, I, I think we're at the level where companies and government as a whole have seen enough supply chain shocks that we can build a set of scenarios that are used, and I, and I hope across Homeland Security that's 
the supply chain aspects and, and supply chain scenarios in general are part of an exercise program and then lead to plans and additional partnerships and capacity. Yeah, and, and as Bob emphasized for me, I mean, obviously from my role at FEMA, FEMA plays a supporting role to state and local governments. They support those other levels of government. They don't, there's no federal primacy on, federal, on disaster response. I envision this being very similar, where whatever agency it is, hopefully CISA, uh, is empowered to support the private sector. And there's private sector primacy, but there's federal support there when necessary. And I think that's key. And we should also not forget, absolutely, the government can incentivize good behavior, largely through federal grant programs. But let's also not forget that the private sector can incentivize itself. And I'll close with the word insurance. Insurance can incentivize good behavior. All right. Well, if you get to make a shameless plug, I will make a shameless plug. For those are, who are really interested in this issue of resilience uh, that my organization, Center for Strategic International Studies, a few months ago uh, put out a report on resilience that looked at the, at the topic of resilience across critical infrastructure, uh, I'm sorry, across climate change, across workforce, uh, supply chain, a brilliant chapter written by my colleague, Emily Harding, and cybersecurity. Uh, and that's at CSIS.org. But I hope you will join me in thanking our brilliant panel uh, for a great conversation. Thank you.